Hello, and welcome back to the lecture series. My name is Professor John Eicher, and the title of today's lecture is The First World War, 1914 to 1918, and The Inner War Period, 1918 to 1939, The Beginning of the End of History. And what I mean by the beginning of the end of history is that after the destruction of World War I and its ambiguous conclusion, the idea that there was a meaningful progression of history moving from worse to better or unenlightened to enlightened became increasingly unbelievable. Basically, World War I wrecked the idea that Western history was a coherent story, and it appeared to confirm that it actually had no meaning or trajectory. It didn't signal the end of events that could be considered historical, but rather it indicated that those events might not have any meaning. To expand on this a bit further, let's return to our concept of progress. Before World War I, Westerners believed strongly in the idea of progress with a capital P, even if modernist artists and intellectuals were more ambivalent, and for more on those artists and intellectuals, see my last lecture on modernism. Specifically, the means of progress, scientific knowledge, technological innovation, social reforms, and mass politics, could realize the myth of progress, endless change, endless improvement, and eventually utopia. Long, indecisive, and taking one soul every 25 seconds for four years, World War I splintered Europeans' optimism for progress, leading to extreme cynicism and extreme hope about the future. Communism, fascism, and global democracy emerged as rebooted myths of progress during the interwar period, which held that a revised application of the means of progress could yet achieve utopian ends, despite the horror and irrationality of the war. But wait, Frederick Nietzsche is here to remind us that it is the same with man as with the tree. The more he seeks to rise into the height and light, the more vigorously do his roots struggle earthward, downward, into the dark, the deep, into evil. And Westerners looked at that and said, well, I'm going all in. So the theses or the arguments that I'm putting forward in this lecture are the First World War from 1914 to 1918 provoked the greatest rupture in European politics, economic society, and culture since the French Revolution in 1789. The war can be explained in two ways. As a historical event that had no meaningful cause and no meaningful conclusion, though it did have a great number of real and meaningful effects on Western society, and as a mythological event that caused Europeans to question the direction and meaning of history and the idea of Western civilization itself. Both explanations provoked Europe to embrace the relativism and subjectivism of modernism and provoked Europeans to search for new, increasingly abstract, and increasingly extreme methods to arrange politics, economic, society, and culture. And these new methods included communism, fascism, and varying degrees of capitalism and socialism. So first of all, every age chooses its war. And the First World War was international. There was extensive use of colonial forces and resources. It was industrial. It relied heavily on machines and technology. It was total and required the mobilization of civilians, which made every adult, in a sense, a combatant. And it was also fought with rational means, but it achieved irrational ends. So military offensives and using new technologies makes rational sense. But a war of attrition, which is what World War I turned into, with no decisive conclusion, did not make rational sense. So first I'm going to talk about the causes of the war in general. Then I'm going to talk about its consequences through the themes of the lecture series, abstraction, bureaucracy, control. And then we're going to turn to the interwar period and look at its more long-range effects. So it's difficult to determine exactly who started the war. It happened so quickly, there was poor communication between the combatants, and there was no major aggressor. Nevertheless, Germany's blank check support for Austria-Hungary against that empire's Serbian provinces transformed what could have been a regional war between Austria-Hungary and Serbia into a European war between Austria-Hungary and Germany and Serbia, Russia, and France. And it was the UK's ignorance and fear of a German-dominated Europe and not really its support for Belgium, which is often what is claimed, that transformed what could have been a mostly European war into a world war with equilibrium on the Western Front. 
So we're gonna roll the powder kegs into the shed right now. And a lot of these center on Germany. So Germany, as we know, is late to the nation state game. It didn't become a country until 1871. And its leaders were insecure about the country's cohesion. Geographically, Germany is surrounded on all sides by potential enemies. When it comes to empire, they believed in all the good territories were already taken. There was also a fear of immigration. In the late 19th century, Germany feared a brain drain of immigrants moving to the Americas. There was also a policy pursued by the government called the Kulturkampf in the late 19th century, wherein Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who was the emperor's right-hand man, declared a cultural war against the country's Catholic minority. And so the intent of the government was to take away a lot of the privileges that the Catholic Church had had and bring them under the guise of the state. Basically, Otto von Bismarck was afraid that Catholics owed more loyalty to the Pope than they did to the German state. Also, at this time, the Reichstag, or the German parliament, was weak and divided. Uh, they couldn't even introduce bills. They could only rubber stamp things that the emperor and the chancellor said they wanted to do. And so given Otto von Bismarck's earlier blood and iron unification of Germany, basically he helped unify this new nation of Germany through war, a new war could aid national unity. In short, the German government feared that Germany could become a second-rate European power. Also, another cause here to some degree is the alliance system, and that pitted the Triple Entente versus the Dual Alliance. Now, no country is necessarily beholden to fulfill its alliance duties, but it was one more element that complicated this situation. And I'm not going to explain all of these alliances. You can see from the picture here that it was quite complicated. There was also severe ignorance across the continent. There hadn't been a general war since the Napoleonic Wars a century ago. And so people had kind of forgotten just how bad it could be. And there was also a belief that capitalism and trade and industry would make war impossible. There was a belief that technology would speed up a war. If everything is moving faster, then wars will too. And there were also middle-class fears, especially in the UK, that young, educated, white-collar males were becoming effeminate. They were in office jobs, and they needed a war to make them more manly. So we've rolled the powder kegs in, and now we will light the match. And lighting the match happens with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand by the Serbian nationalist Gavario Princip in Sarajevo on the 28th of June, 1914. And here, if you want to pause the lecture, you can take a look at this timeline and the events that happened leading up to the war. And then I will let your imagination fill in what is happening in this GIF. So the story of this assassination is actually quite weird. So as you can see here on this map, Austria-Hungary is pictured in red. And they have a province that is composed mostly of Serbians. And some of those Serbians want to have independence from the empire. And as you can see here on this close-up of the empire, it was having difficulty keeping all of these ethnic elements together. And so when Archduke Franz Ferdinand visits Sarajevo, this is a very tense situation. Anyways... He gets in his motorcade, he drives off, and in the crowd, there's a gang, a group of Serbian nationalists who are interested in assassinating him. But they're lined up on the parade route, and the driver takes a wrong turn. So they melt back into the crowd, they're going to their safe house. Gavario Princip is walking along the street. All of a sudden, he looks up, here comes the motorcade into view, he pulls out his gun and shoots him and his wife, Sophie. And this then is the match that lights all those powder kegs on fire, and suddenly World War I is upon Europe. So first I'm going to talk about the Eastern Front. The Eastern Front was as destructive as the Western Front, but there was greater movement. It resembled more of a traditional war, so I'm going to focus on this a little bit less than the very bizarre situation on the Western Front. First of all, Russia tries to invade Germany early in the war, but it was turned back at the Battle of Tannenberg, and from then on, it was essentially fighting a losing battle. Austria-Hungary, also a fairly incompetent military force, Germany takes over from them to take full command of both the East and the Western Front. 
Germany and Russia trade offensives until finally Russia breaks in 1917. And Russia was basically a mess throughout the entire war. On the war front, it was unprepared. Some soldiers were even sent out to battle without guns. Also, the Ottoman Empire to the south was allied with the Austria-Hungarian Empire in Germany, and they effectively blockaded Russia from using any of their Black Sea ports. On the home front, Russia had poor food distribution, high inflation, eventually workers strike, and that leads to the February Revolution, and then eventually the Bolshevik Revolution a few months later. And finally, Russia pulls out of the war in early 1918, and they sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which effectively ends the war in the East. So on the Western Front, Germany employs what they called the Schlieffen Plan. This plan required them to avoid the Ardennes Mountains, which is on the line between France and Germany, and instead swing through neutral Belgium, which is flat lands and has very good roads, and capture Paris in a matter of weeks. Well, they didn't really count on Belgium putting up much resistance, but they did. And that gives France and the UK just enough time to mobilize and stop Germany in what was called the Miracle on the Marne in September 1914. And this then is what results in stalemate. So I'm just going to go into a few little facts about World War I that are pretty interesting and you might have heard of before. The first concerns the Christmas truce in December 1914, wherein soldiers on the Western Front come out, they play soccer, they take pictures with each other, exchange gifts, and a lot of times this is spoken about as being, you know, the power of the human spirit coming through in a time of adversity, when in fact it's more of an indication of these soldiers' ignorance in the amount of destruction they were participating in. The battles of World War I are not the way we think of typical battles. Take, for instance, the Battle of the Somme in 1916. During this battle, the front moved six miles in four months at the cost of over a million soldiers. That's not a battle so much as a war within a war. You also have deep mining of the enemy. And here you see a picture of that. Basically, soldiers would build tunnels alongside the enemy's trenches and pack them with explosives and then blow them up. And it would result in these terrific explosions that could be heard in London and even Dublin. In one such instance, French soldiers were actually buried upright. The explosion pushed so much soil against their trench that they were literally buried alive with their bayonets sticking out of the ground. And as you can imagine, with all this death and destruction taking place within a very limited geographic area, body parts of all these millions of soldiers would be churned up and rediscovered days, months, or years later. It was a very grotesque environment. I want to go into trench warfare a little bit here. Sometimes we get the impression that the trenches in World War I looked like this picture. This is not what a trench looked like in World War I. This is what trenches looked like in World War I. Three layers, four maybe even connected to each other. There were basements in these trenches that would go down two, three, four stories. You had layers and layers of barbed wire out front. You had artillery in the back. I mean, you put millions of young men in a field for four years. When they're not fighting, they're doing other things. And in this case, they're building trenches and fortifications. And it was even said that you could walk from the English Channel to Switzerland in trenches. This is an aerial photo of northern France. This too. At the top, you can see where a forest used to be. So with such great defense, who needs offense? Well, no one, unless you want to win, right? So how do you win? Well, the mission is attrition. And attrition means basically you kill more of them than they kill of you. And annihilation requires innovation. Which brings us to abstraction, bureaucracy, and control. The best way to command and kill millions of people. So innovations in industry and technology aided the abstract and economical, of course, killing of thousands of humans. So like take, for instance, the machine gun. A soldier with a single-shot bolt-action rifle has to literally decide every time they pull the trigger whether or not they're going to kill someone. A machine gun, you basically pull the trigger once and start swinging it around, and very quickly, 10, 12, 20 people are dead. You don't need to think about it too much. 
Poison gas. It's easy to kill from a distance with poison gas. You don't even have to see the people you're killing. Cleaning out a trench with a flamethrower is much easier than using a bayonet, for instance. Innovations and abstractions also help governments, civilians, and soldiers stomach killing thousands of humans. Charts, graphs, and maps turn people into numbers. It's easy for a bureaucrat sitting in Paris to make decisions that will kill thousands of humans based on charts. They don't have to be there seeing them die. Long-range artillery. There are stories of French artillerymen drinking wine while they're lobbing shells at other soldiers two miles away and killing them. Aerial bombing turns humans into ants. It's easier to kill an ant than a human. And torpedoes allowed sailors and submarines to not see the individuals that they're killing and drowning to death. Innovations in bureaucracy also help governments and industries monitor and control millions of humans both on the war front and at home. So government censorship, very robust in the First World War. Court martialing became more efficient because soldiers were more easily tracked through their bureaucratic paper trail. And on the home front, lots of new boards set up to control all aspects of society. Rationing, propaganda, internment camps for enemy aliens, and war economy boards. So what's the human cost of all this? In total, 40 million military and civilian casualties. And casualties means both wounded and dead. So if we apply these numbers to Germany, the population of Germany in 1914 was 68 million people. 2 million ended up dying, and 4 million ended up being wounded. If you apply those same numbers to the United States in 2020, there were 61 million 18 to 35-year-old men, which received the brunt of the casualties. That's the equivalent in the United States of 9.5 million dead and 19 million wounded. 9.5 million is more than the combined size of Iowa, Arkansas, and Kansas. And the amount wounded, 19 million, is nearly the size of New York, which is the fourth largest state in the United States. If you applied this to a typical university, that would equal nearly half of all male students being casualties. You can imagine what this psychologically does to a generation of young people. Also, 1.2 million British and French colonial troops were mobilized for the war and 140,000 Chinese laborers were uprooted and taken to Europe. Some of the personal consequences for the soldiers included shell shock, now known as PTSD, disabilities, addictions, and STDs, which weakened and angered a generation. And you have children that grow up accepting warfare and its privations as normal. So all of this destruction shatters Europe's mythology about progress. And so to examine some of the irrationalities of this war, who wins when so many are lost? And what material or moral advantages does modern war actually gain? Considering tactics, you used to have noble strategic goals. We're going to take that city. We're going to take that hill. But now you're operating under the illogic of the defensive and ignoble goals of attrition. When it comes to industry and total war, it's clear now that machines surpass humans in importance, and it becomes increasingly difficult to discern who's a civilian and who's a combatant. Killing that woman who's stamping out 5, 10, 15 shells a day might be more strategically important than killing that soldier on the front who has a rifle. Also, World War I demonstrates the irrationality of European governance. The secret diplomatic alliances that caused the war really angered Europeans. And so the result coming out of it politically was democracy in Germany and the former Austria-Hungarian Empire, communism in Russia, and United States President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points that advocated national self-determination and an international body called the League of Nations. Also, the armistice between the Allies and Germany was simply an agreement to stop fighting. It was not an actual solution. And the conduct of the war and its outcome, combined with imperial subject sacrifices, really deepened skepticism of imperial rule. For instance, in the British Empire, during the war, they introduced what was called the Defense of India Act in 1915, but they chose to extend it well beyond the war. And this act allowed local governments to make rules to detain suspects indefinitely without representation and to try them by special tribunals if they were reasonably suspected, in quotes, of being hostile to the empire or acting against the safety of the empire. Pretty arbitrary. 
Also, the irrationality of the war finds another expression through art and culture. After the war, there was a desire to forget about it. It didn't make any sense. It caused a lot of destruction. Let's just forget. And so war vets, when they come home, they're ignored in Germany. Germany does provide quite a few social services for them, but the population is rather ashamed of them. And in England, they're treated more materially poorly, but they're given a lot of honors and accolades, so they feel a little bit better about their position, but they're still not being looked after very well. Also coming out of the war, you have an increase in sexual freedom. One thinks here of the flapper movement. During the war, men and women uh, both were exposed to many new experiences. On the war front, you have prostitution, and so this is known as an era of sexual freedom. Jazz music also becomes very popular during the 1920s coming out of the war. It emphasized freedom and improvisation over structure and rules, which felt very freeing after the restrictive wartime atmosphere. You also see the rise of Dada art. Dada art is nonsense art. It emphasizes relativism over objectivism. There's no reality, only abstraction, and both reality and abstraction are horrific, and you can see this through these paintings. And in literature, you have the triumph of fiction over history and the triumph of irony over sincerity. In the 1920s, there weren't a lot of history books on the war because it didn't make a lot of historical sense. Instead, you have a lot of fiction written about the war, the subjective experience of individual soldiers caught in this absurdity. And here you see one of those soldiers, Ernest Hemingway, seated in 1925 with the people depicted in the novel, The Sun Also Rises. So if the world's leaders are irrational, then everyone is irrational. And if anyone can be a war casualty, why not live for today? And so suddenly, all of those modernist artists and intellectuals that I talked about in the last lecture start making sense, like Friedrich Nietzsche, Albert Einstein, Freud, Kafka, Du Bois, and Pablo Picasso. So coming out of the war, there's a lot of insecurity about where the Western world is going. And there's new people and new movements that come to the fore that believe that progress can be achieved through political experimentation. And the tools of control during World War I were then redeployed to manage interwar societies via public welfare, consumerism, surveillance, and incarceration. You have the explosion of abstraction after the war, from eugenics, also known as race science, to entertainment, motion pictures, which are abstractions, to economics, the stock market, right, also an abstraction. Westerners move deeper and deeper into a world of abstractions. And bureaucracy, managing social services created for all those vets and others, and promoting consumption allowed bureaucracies to accumulate information, allocate resources, and manage populations. So politicians across the West remained sure of progress via its means, but disagreed over its ends, whether those ends would be communism, which promised progress to all members of a certain class, Wilsonian democracy, which promised progress to everyone, but read the fine print concerning imperial subjects, minorities, and the poor, and fascism, which promoted progress to all members of a certain nation or race. But first... I want us to consider this quote by the Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin. And what inspired this story was a painting by Paul Klee titled Angelus Novus. A Klee painting named Angelus Novus shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned towards the past. Now, where we perceive a chain of events, because we're looking at history from the side like a chronology, he sees one single catastrophe because he's looking at it head on, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel of history would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing in from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. So basically, Benjamin is arguing that progress simply means a progression of events that we can't stop, 
many of which are catastrophic. So first, let's look at Soviet communism. So you have the outbreak of the February or March Revolution in 1917. February or March, depending on the Gregorian or Julian calendars. During the war, workers, soldiers became increasingly disgusted with the way the country was running, and they form what were called Soviets, which are small councils of leadership. And by activating those, they were able to allow the Duma, which was the national parliament, to take power. At the same time, Nicholas II, the Tsar, abdicates the throne, and you have what is essentially a democratic revolution in early 1917. At the same time, the Germans get in contact with Vladimir Lenin, who's hiding out in Switzerland, and they say, hey, if you promise to go to Russia and foment a revolution there, we will offer you a sealed train through our territory from Switzerland to St. Petersburg. And Lenin said, sure. Following this in October or November, the Bolsheviks, led by Lenin and Trotsky, uh, perform a coup d'etat against the government, and they take it over, and they have a communist revolution. They initially take over the Winter Palace, but more important than taking this seat of power was taking over the mode of communications that linked that empire together, the country's telegraph stations. And by doing that, they could consolidate bureaucratic power over the country. The Bolsheviks, also called the Reds, made peace with Germany, and then they turned to civil war, which lasted from 1917 to 1923. And here they were fighting against individuals that still believed in the monarchy, and they were called the Whites. So here you have the Bolsheviks, and here is who they were pitted against. Anarchists, separatist groups like Poland and Finland and Ukraine, and established powers like Japan, the United Kingdom, the United States. And even Germany, enemies getting along together because no one wanted communism. But the Bolsheviks win, and they institute a communist regime. Now, I'm not going to go into that entire revolution. Uh, it mirrors, in many regards, the French Revolution. And for more on that, you can check out my Enlightenment lecture. The way they consolidate the revolution is through the bureaucracy. The Soviet leadership inherited a bureaucratic authoritarian system that was paranoid of revolution. There's a quote here that I think is incredibly relevant. Usually it's attributed to Stalin, actually should be attributed to Kurt Tucholsky. The death of one man is a tragedy. The death of a million is a statistic. And if there's anything that sums up the power of abstraction, I think it's this quote. So after Lenin's death in 1924, Stalin rises up through the party to consolidate a bureaucratic dictatorship. And he had a two-pronged plan for bringing the Soviet Union into the modern era. One was through industry in urban areas, and the other was through overhauling agriculture in the countryside. When it came to industry, he pursued what was called the first five-year plan, the first of many five-year plans. And the point here was to expand industry using largely prison labor and then advertise this as progress via abstractions. Production is up 118%. Production is up 180%, right? It's all abstractions. And in the countryside, he pursued what was called dekulakization. Now, kulaks were supposedly a class of rich farmers that were exploiting poor peasants. They were abstract insofar as no one could really define what a kulak was. So Moscow leadership basically left it up to local politicians to define them, which usually ended up being anyone those local officials didn't like. So a kulak could be someone who owned a large farm or just a few head of cattle. It could be someone who hired 100 workers or someone who hired a neighbor boy to collect eggs. It could be someone who is new to an area or someone who is local but married into the wrong family. Either way, local officials had to come up with a quota of kulaks in their area, whose land and homes would then be seized and who would be sent off to collective farms. And in this way, kulaks moved from an abstract category to a real and really persecuted category. There were upwards of 5 million deaths during dekulakization. And of course, you can imagine that because if you kill all the farmers in your most productive grain-growing regions, here pictured in red, there's not going to be any food for anyone. Finally, on a social level, Stalin used the Soviet bureaucracy to destroy peasant and indigenous cultures 
and turn them into nations because that is the progress of history, according to Marx. You go from peasants to nations, and then you're supposed to destroy the nations and turn them into communists. So what this looks like on the ground is that Stalin sends out an army of bureaucrats into the countryside, gets in contact with peasants who consider themselves peasants, who consider themselves local, and tries to get them to identify themselves as a particular nation, uh, like I'm Polish, I'm Ukrainian, whatever. Those bureaucrats then go back to Moscow and record all this information. Ten years later, Stalin looks at the numbers and says, oh my goodness, there's millions of Poles living on our border with Poland. They're going to revolt against us and join Poland. We need to do something about this. So they go back to those areas, round up those same peasants who really haven't started thinking of themselves as Polish much, and deport them physically to Kazakhstan. So if you ever see someone from Kazakhstan who looks like they should be from Europe, it's because they are probably descendants of some of those peasants. Finally here, Stalin used uh, some of those concepts that we talked about during our nationalism lecture, including invented traditions to legitimate power at home. And here one thinks of May Day, this invented communist holiday, and also imagined communities to extend power abroad. And one thinks here of the popular front that was operative across the world, and especially in Spain during the Spanish Civil War, during the interwar period. Turning now to Britain, France, and the United States, they're victorious, but they come out of the war weak, except, of course, for the United States. France had 4.2 million casualties, 10% of its population, and it owed $4 billion to the United States. Both Britain and France created welfare programs for veterans and fertility programs for women to try and rebound their populations. And the U.S. really emerges as wealthy, confident, but also isolationist. They had relatively minor war losses. They have a lot of money coming in from Europe. It's newly urbanized. It's increasingly industrialized. And eventually throughout the 1920s, it isolates itself from world politics and focuses on its own backyard, particularly Latin America. Also, during the interwar period, all Allied governments expanded public and private freedoms. So throughout the late 1910s and 1920s, many Western countries, with the notable exceptions of France, Italy, and the southern United States under Jim Crow, allowed women's suffrage, while on the private side, the increasing availability of cars and telephones allowed people to experience more physical freedom and ability to communicate. But despite these freedoms, they also expanded social control. For example, most Western countries were very interested in eugenics. Now, there are two kinds of eugenics. The first is called positive eugenics, which aim to improve individuals' material lives through better environments, nutrition, and promoting the fecundity of supposedly superior couples. And the second is called negative eugenics, which aim to sterilize or kill individuals who were socially undesirable. These ideas were popular across the Western world. In the UK, it was actually Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, who initially promoted positive eugenics, and he also created the first IQ test, which, of course, reduces human intelligence to an abstraction, before advocates of negative eugenics took over in the 1920s. And in the United States, negative eugenics was sanctified by the 1927 Supreme Court ruling Buck v. Bell, which sanctified the sterilization of Carrie Buck for supposedly being feeble-minded. The United States' eugenics movement actually served as inspiration for Hitler's Nazi regime. There was a lot of cross-communication between the two in the early 30s, who thought eugenics should extend to murder. Also here, I want to draw attention to the United States with its prohibition movement and the development of the FBI and the federal prison system. Basically, the United States introduces prohibition during the 1920s, which necessitates an enforcement of prohibition, which causes the rise of the FBI and the federal prison system. But then when alcohol is made legal again in 1933, you just can't give up and abandon these bureaucratic and controlling apparatuses, so you must retool them. And it is during the 1930s that the federal government becomes interested in regulating and prosecuting people for marijuana. And so they retooled the federal prison system to handle all of these new criminals, usually composed of poor blacks and poor whites. In 1929, there's a crisis of capitalism in the West. The 1929 Wall Street stock market crash was caused by speculation in the stock market. 
And Americans had believed that post-World War I capitalism could usher in a consumer utopia. And investing in the stock market was a high risk and highly popularized, but minimally understood since stocks, bonds, and other financial instruments are abstractions. And I think there's a really great quote here that summarizes this tension between a reality and abstraction during the Great Depression. If there are enough fellows with guts in this country to do like us, we will march eastward and we will cut the east off. We have got the granaries. We have the hogs, the cattle, the corn. The east has nothing but mortgages on our places. Right? The east only has abstractions. We have realities. But you know what? Those abstractions do end up being more powerful than reality. Also in 1933 in the United States, at the height of the Depression, you have the Dust Bowl. And there was a belief in the United States in this idea of manifest destiny that you could create a utopia in the Western United States for growing grain and all sorts of crops. And that grain and those crops were increasingly needed after World War I and the collapse of Russian agriculture to support a growing world economy. And so you have an expanding farm operation across the West, oftentimes on marginal land. Well, in 1933, after a series of droughts, all of this comes to naught with the Dust Bowl. And it kicks up dust, so much dust, in fact, that layers of it were found on the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Oklahoma loses about 20% of its population owing to the Dust Bowl. They're called Okies. They want to migrate out of Oklahoma. Uh, actually, California, Florida, and Colorado established border blockades against fellow Americans so they could not immigrate to their states. And to help ameliorate all this, the Roosevelt administration introduces what was called the New Deal, uh, this vast expansion of American bureaucracy. And this results in the creation of all sorts of new government programs that do, in fact, help people, but also expand that bureaucracy of the United States. Now let's turn to the rise of fascism and Nazism in Germany. So the Nazi revolution, or they like to think of it as a third way between communism and capitalism, was the last novel arrangement of Western politics and society. Because the Nazi intention was to create a new type of human being from whom would spring a new morality, a new social system, and eventually a new international order. And what I mean by the last novel arrangement of Western politics and society is that the Nazi movement was the last time a leader or a party tried to completely remake an entire society along untried and untested lines. Since then, we've had various iterations of socialism and democracy and capitalism and communism, but this truly was the last time the West has tried something brand new, and it ended in absolute destruction. So Germany's economic tipping point happens along with the crash of the stock market in the United States in 1929. There's massive unemployment, up to 24%. And it also, in 1929, coincides with the 10th anniversary of the Treaty of Versailles and renegotiating repayments to the Allies. Germany then reaches a political tipping point in 1932 with the election of Adolf Hitler. The Nazis took power legally through a democratic process, and politicians at the time thought that he could be tamed. Well, communists, pretty much everyone agrees, set the Reichstag on fire, the parliament, which provoked Hitler's Enabling Act, which terminated civil liberties across Germany. Communists, Jews, Nazi opposition immediately imprisoned or killed during the Night of the Long Knives, and Hitler then consolidates his power as a dictator. Citizens temporarily giving up freedom to power is rarely temporary, because power has an endless appetite for control. And I want to stress the newness of Nazism. It's often talked about as being a conservative movement, and a lot of the window dressing for it was conservative. But its goals and its ambitions were absolutely modern and absolutely radical. So here you see a piece of Nazi propaganda highlighting the traditional dress of a German worker. The reality, though, is pictured on the bottom. Hitler is riding in an airplane, and you can see a piece of his own propaganda there on the front door. So Nazism was a modern political movement led by a celebrity. It was not a conservative political party led by a politician. Hitler's whole aim was to follow the spirit of the war front. Just follow along. And he used invented traditions to legitimate his power, 
like this concept of Arianism and torch parades. It was actually the Nazis that introduced the torch relay to the Olympic Games in 1936. The Greeks had employed a ritual fire in the ancient Olympics, but the torchbearer relay was an entirely Nazi invention. The Nazis also used imagined communities to expand their power abroad. They produced what were called Auslandsdeutsche films, overseas German films, with the intention of promoting a global Aryan Nazi community. And they captured state, corporate, and media control. The Associated Press loved the Nazis throughout the 1930s. Hugo Boss designed the Nazi SS uniform. Coca-Cola, Fanta loved doing business with the Nazi regime. If you go to the store and buy bear medicine, you should also be aware that they developed the Zyklon B gas that was used to kill Jews. And here you see a punch card uh, made by IBM for the SS race office. And all of this let them pass the Reich citizenship law and the protection of German blood and German honor laws, which basically disenfranchised all Jews in Germany and made them second-class citizens. Germany's robust bureaucracy also allowed the Nazis to find 600,000 German Jews, which were traceable via bureaucratic abstractions like censuses, tax rolls, land deeds. And they justified everything they were doing by abstract race science and propaganda. These laws were also very enforceable by bureaucracies, from local governments and academia to lawyers, doctors, businesses, and the media. Finally here, in 1938, a year before the beginning of World War II, the nations of the world convened what's called the Evian Conference. Germany was expelling a lot of its Jews, and the nations of the world decided to get together and figure out what they were going to do about it. Well, they decided they wouldn't help them at all. And all of this then propels the world, and Germany specifically, towards the Holocaust. So a final thought here on this idea of living in unprecedented times. The question is often put out there, are we living in a new era of neo-Nazism or neo-communism? Well, yes, we are. Insofar as we reduce each other to abstractions, like race, class, and political affiliation. Beware of living your life entirely in abstraction, entirely online, and beware of those who claim we are living in an unprecedented times, especially if they demand unprecedented power to solve an abstract threat, be it political, social, or environmental. There's a quote here, an ancient quote from the Torah or from the Bible, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. There are always historical corollaries to any problem we face, since power always has the same goal, avarice and immortality. So if you want to understand the Russian Revolution, take a look at the French Revolution. If you want to understand the Holocaust, take a look at imperialism. Neither Hitler nor Lenin and Stalin cared about the people they claimed to want to save anyway. They only cared for power at any price, because Hitler and Stalin brought the Holocaust, war, gulags, and show trials to the people they were supposed to be helping. And even in the United States, we now have a precedent for imprisoning citizens based on an abstraction with the internment of Japanese during World War II. History can be a weapon of the weak. And the weak will always lose if they are convinced that history is irrelevant, if they are convinced they're living in unprecedented times. Here are the theses once again. I'll leave them up for a little bit so you can review them. Thank you so much for listening to this lecture. Please check out my other lectures, hit like, subscribe to the channel, and thanks again.